Sanchez, I'm Jeff. And I'm Ron. Ron, there's no time for an intro. There's no time for an intro. What the fuck are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Seriously, though, uh, this was the first time it, I've actually been exhausted after just compiling the notes, because so much shit happened this week. There was a lot that happened this week. It's ridiculous. So, yeah, uh, we were going to be spending uh, time on, like, three or four topics, actually delving into them like we normally do. Everything else, lightning round, and I'm, I'm actually sticking to lightning round I was going to say, we mean time. it this time. First up in the movie section, Hasbro has planned the next decade of Transformers films. And there was much rejoicing. Exactly. <laughs> so apparently the Brain Trust has yes. the next decade planned out. Uh, they have a, f- a few good people working on it. I'm still skeptical. The next York. decade of fucktastic films. Uh, my thoughts, uh, get Michael Bay the fuck away from it. Yes. Next up. Terminator sequels are basically dead in the water. I am so sad. Makes me super, super sad. Um, I guess slight spoilers for Terminator Genesis if you haven't seen it. Uh, I was really, really excited to see a Dr. Skynet. Yes. It would have been really cool. I know. He was I, one of the best. He was barely in the movie. And he was one of the best he parts. He was one of the of best it. parts of the movie. So, like, a full movie given to him would have Which, been I mean, amazing. that's obviously where it was going. For the next one. So, yeah, no, pretty sad about that. Um, what's interesting, though, is tell them why it's fucked. Even though it did so well internationally, especially in China, tell them okay, why uh, it's fucked. Okay, this was fascinating to me because I think we might have even reported in a recent episode. I know for sure we talked about it. I don't know if it got onto the podcast, though, but we were talking about how Terminator might have a shot at not being canceled. We reported that. Because of the box office china returns because we it had a budget of 150 million dollars and that's just the movie that's not the marketing or anything speculation has been that the marketing budget was equal to or greater than that 150 million dollar budget so it needed to make about 300 million dollars to break even and it didn't get anywhere near that domestically but then it went international and it did pretty damn good it did really well internationally and then when it re- was released in china it did gangbusters and we were china. like yes we're getting dr skynet and then i pull up this article on nerdist today and find this really really strange little box office tidbit that i'd never heard of and this has apparently been going on for a few years so apparently U.S. box office revenue in China, you only get 25% of your returns. China keeps the other 75%. This is because of a broken down negotiation in the, uh, the t- there was like a disagreement in a tax percentage. Guess what it was before it was 25? 13. That was wow. what we used to get. So basically this means Terminator has been dead in the water for a while for a while because the China box office was the only chance it had. Yes. Uh, they also announced not only were the Terminator sequel movies basically canceled. I forget how they worded it exactly. I believe it was they are on indefinite hold with no plans to revive them. They're canceled. They're done. Yeah. They also apparently had a planned TV series tie-in. They were going like gung ho with this. Yeah. And it's it's dead. It's done. It makes yeah. me really sad. This was this was the most I've liked Terminator since. The second one for yeah. me. Now it, I was trying to hate it so bad, but I couldn't hate it. I mean, it has its problems with me. It's still, a fun movie, though. But it was a good movie. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's a shame. So yeah, shame. now I was really looking forward to what they were going to do in the sequel, but yeah. I guess now I won't know. About another ten years, we'll get another one. So oh, uh, one more thing I wanted to add to this before we move on reg- regarding Terminator: the rights of Terminator revert back to James Cameron in 2019, even though I'll- they've made a movie. Yes, uh, they apparently have something in effect because typically the way the rights works is if you haven't made a movie in eight to ten years, it's usually the time frame like with Daredevil. Right. They didn't have a Daredevil movie in nine or ten years and it reverted back. Uh, this one is apparently some weird negotiation they had worked out with Cameron. He automatically gets the rights back in 2019. So we don't even know what's happening with the... the well, he's lost his goddamn mind, that's, so... That's another good point. He is uh, also solely focused on making his Avatar films right now. His 20 Avatar films in oh production. Oh, God, we're going to get a blue cat Terminator on some foreign planet. Yeah. And, and it's, it's going to have a bow it's gonna and be, arrow. It's going to be based on, what, Hunchback of Notre Dame instead of Pocahontas this time. Yeah. Yeah, before we get into an Avatar rant, though, yeah, we need to move on. <laughs> but just R.I.P. Terminator Genesis, I really liked you. It's a shame we didn't get any of your sequels. Uh, next up, speaking of sequels, 
we may get this one. I don't know. Pacific Rim 2, we've reported on it to death the last like two or three weeks. I won't get into too many details other than... We don't know I if it's going to... I am so confused. I just want to say, by the way... I, I think... Del, by the way, Del Toro talks, Del Toro is confused. Because, uh, uh, okay, the story we're referring to is the most recent Pacific Rim 2 nugget was that um, I believe they met in prep for New York Comic Con, but Macy Williams, who's Arya from Game of Thrones, and Guillermo Del Toro had lunch together. Del, Del, Del Toro loved her so much from just them talking, he was like, if Pacific Rim 2 happens, she's in a Jaeger. Which, when I read that, I was like, fuck, fuck yeah, yes. this movie better happen, because... And it's going to have a needle that pops out of the wrist. Yeah, dude, Arya in a Jaeger with a mech sword, sign me up, man. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, now we can just get the studios to sign it up. At, at least if Pacific Rim 2 doesn't end up happening, uh, Del Toro is actually known for having strong female leads. So anything in the future, even non-Pacific Rim related, that they can team up for will be good. Yes. So that this is this is a good thing, even if Pacific Rim Two doesn't happen. Uh, Power Rangers is having a reboot. I have so many mixed emotions. Uh, about I'm this. gonna I'm gonna give most of this, the the airtime we're gonna give to this to Ron because I was a gigantic Power Rangers fan as a kid. I fell off of it. So uh, the news article though was reporting on casting additions for so far the Red Ranger, the Black Ranger, and the Pink Ranger. They I, have a, I know they have none a, of these people. They have a few selections. Uh, most of them are fairly unknown. It uh, looks like one of them was actually in The Martian. I'm not sure which character in The Martian. Yeah, Terra Nova and The Martian. Naomi Scott. So, yeah, uh, quickly, Ron, what do you think of this? I don't see the point, to be honest with you. Um, it's going to depend a lot on the tone, which I imagine is still going to be very childlike. I don't think it's going to be aimed at adults at all, which I think is a mistake because... Power Rangers today, it's kind of like the Transformers cartoons of today. The kids that see them don't give a shit about them. Maybe they watch them, but it doesn't mean anything to them. Like, say, G1 did to me. And I feel like it's going to be the same. The people that remember Power Rangers when it first started and was in love with it are all grown up. And I'm not saying it needs to be like a fucking, like, you know, Del Toro turn on it or anything. But it, I think it needs to be aimed in between adults and kids, and I don't think it will be. At least accessible for both. Yes. Like, um... Like we always refer to, um, the Batman the Animated Series works if you're 80 or if you're 8. Yes. Avatar The Last Airbender works if you're 80 or if you're 8. Um, I think even a Guardians of the Galaxy tone would probably yeah, be good. Just, just something in between. Something in don't, between. Don't aim for the, the lowest denominator. That's yeah. the main thing. But I think it, they're probably going to shoot for PG. Probably. Is yeah. my guess. Uh, final thoughts on Power Rangers reboot, Ron? I don't see the point. Moving on. <laughs> Speaking of casting, this is actually something we're both heavily interested in. Yes. Assassin's Creed, the uh, Fassbender-led film, has Jeremy Irons and Brendan Gleeson now on board. Hell yeah, man. They have some star, uh, they have I was star already, power well, going. I was this. already on board with that movie this, once I saw Fassbender in the costume. I'm going to say right now, in the current group, the movie with the best chance of the video game adaptations of making them hit and hit big the way that X-Men kind of, and Blade and Spider-Man yeah. kind of started superhero movies, this one is the one I look at just because of the cast. Right. If Hollywood realizes that these A-list actors are willing to sign and be on board, that I think that automatically gives it ten times more credence. Because who the, the first Resident Evil movie, look at the cast. Yeah. You know, the actors aren't all... You know, they're not horrible, but... The most A-list actor is Michelle Rodriguez. Fast forward 13 years or 14 Mia Jovovich years. Jovovich had already done Fifth Element at that point, too. Yeah, but even, you know, like right now we're looking at Jeremy Irons, uh, yeah, I mean, she, and Fast. She was a known face is what I'm getting yeah, that's, at. That's, it was like a AAA yeah. movie with a big budget that's a good and point. everything. She was starring a lo- role. But yeah, it's come but, a long way in just yeah. a little over a decade. So yeah, um, I, I can't wait for this. My, the, my two predictions I want to make. Jeremy Irons is a notorious villain. In movies. So I'm going to think he's the target. The main target. Brendan Gleeson is typically in... I don't want to say supporting role, but usually he is the backbone of the main character. In Bruges. Yeah. Yeah. And stuff like that. Um, Even in Harry Potter. I think... um, And in uh, 28 Days Later... 
So I think he's going to be the guy when Fastbender is in the past and he's in the assassin's uniform. I think he's going to be the guy that the Fastbender falls back on. For anyone not familiar with the names, Jeremy Irons is currently Alfred in the new upcoming Justice League films. And Borgia in the Borgias. Uh, uh, Brendan Gleeson, uh, he might be more well known as Mad Eye Moody. He was in Harry Potter. Yes. And, and here's, here's, here's a funny little tidbit before we move on. Jeremy Irons, Pope Borgia in the Borgias, the most corrupt pope in history. Ezio Auditore's main villain is Pope Borgia. Really? That's, yeah. That's funny. I just had to throw that out there. All right. We've got another little casting tidbit to get to. John Voight has apparently joined Fantastic Beasts, the Harry Potter spinoff. Yes. That movie also has a ridiculous cast. Was, uh, we put Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell. Uh, Ezra Miller, who was in Perks of Being a Wallflower, currently okay. The Flash in their solo film. Okay. He's in it. Um, and I believe they had a couple others. There was, the whole cast was great. It was, it was pretty star studded as well. Um, I am not the world's biggest Harry Potter fan, but I'll probably check that one out just for the casts. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I mean, I'm, my wife is a Harry Potter fan, so we'll be in the you'll theater. Be, you'll be way. in the theater regardless. Yeah. All right. We've got, uh, this, this isn't uh, any more, casting choices or anything like that but we have a little bit more movie news uh two mad max sequels are in development at warner brothers fuck yes this was confirmed by george miller fuck yes also said at least two fuck yes george miller is the well most- uh we reported earlier um i don't remember now how solid it was but uh tom hardy had signed up for four supposedly tom hardy's like all over mad max yeah uh the uh the other cool thing is Freaking George Miller is the most ambitious 75 year old on the planet. Like, yeah. if, if, I, if I'm 75, I'm he pretty sure. He is, remember we said Ridley Scott has reached the fuck it stage of his career, and if there's a movie he wants to make, uh, he, he, everyone except you, me, and the other guy on another podcast loved Prometheus too. Prometheus, everyone else fucking hated it, right? And he said, fuck you, I'm making Prometheus 2 either way, because that's just the stage of his career he's in. George Miller's in the same area. He's going to do whatever the hell he wants at this point. I also think it's incredibly cool how his he's, he actually gets to kind of have a book into his film career. He started with Mad Max. He's a name because yes. of Mad Max, and now he's going out with Mad Max. That's pretty fucking cool. Supposedly, also, he's they've been in talks with him for one of the DC movies. No one knows what it is yet. Uh, I He did shoot down the Superman thing. Did he, he? he? He confirmed he's not going to be doing Superman at all, but he did say... He confirmed he has been talking about doing something, which yeah. could be anything because they're a little all over the place. All right. Uh, let's see. We have uh, – this ties into Mad Max a little bit. Uh, one of the coolest things about Mad Max Fury Road was the score. Yes. Uh, the composer is now attached to score Deadpool, which is genius because uh, if you think about that Mad Max Fury Road – the the bat shit score going on really sets the mood and the tone and the kind of frenetic pacing of it. Yeah, the guy knows what he's doing clearly. And uh, I told you as soon as I read this article, I got the the main theme from Fury Road stuck in my head. Last time I saw that movie was like April or yeah. May or uh, March, so it's been a while. So that means it's a good theme if I still remembered it. Right. So uh, if he can add to the bat shit insanity tone, uh, Fury Road, Deadpool. I mean, I said this is probably the smartest thing Fox has done since hiring Hugh Jackman. <laughs> All right, we've got some more Marvel news. Uh, Tom Hiddleston, famously, he might as well just change his fucking name to Loki, or at least yeah, his middle name Loki, Loki Hiddleston. He explained why his uh, scene as Loki in Age of Ultron was now, cut. I didn't get to read this article, and I was very interested in this. So uh, what happened? Okay, this was really interesting. His scene was... In the same scene that Idris Elba's character was in, where he okay, was doing that like, makes sense. He was he was the in, Ragnarok setup. He would yeah. He actually filmed scenes with um, Thor and Idris Elba's character. Okay. The reason they cut them out is actually funny. What I wanted to bring up: Loki is so far and away the best villain they have going. It confused test audiences to where they thought he was controlling Ultron. Really? Yeah. To where. What happened was the test audiences got so confused thinking that Loki was again the main bad guy, partially because Ultron's a shitty villain. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's okay, but he, he was a letdown. Let's yeah, be he really was. So people were like expecting Loki to be the behind the like, scenes. Oh, dude, this course. movie just blew up. So uh, yeah. after the, the uh, after uh, Feige and Whedon 
reviewed the reaction to the test audience as they cut his scene from the film to avoid confusion. Wow. That right there shows you they have a major fucking villain problem. Yes. Major villain problem. Yes. And why I have fully gravitated. I'm fucking... I couldn't be more excited for, like, Civil War and what's upcoming. Right now, my heart's with the Netflix stuff. Like, just the, the, the ability to have time to delve into the villains, the R rating. My heart is starting to switch more towards that, I think, than the movies. Yeah, I don't I don't think they expected Loki to blow up the way he did. But, I mean, they used him in two very outstanding ways in two very key movies. Two movies, mind you, that no one thought was going to be any good, really. Like, everybody's excited to see it. But like, There's no way it's going to be any There's good. No way it can work. But it's going to be the best steaming pile of shit I've ever seen. Thor and the Avengers. A major team-up movie. The first time it's ever been done. First time it's ever been done. There's no way. You know, that movie had everything against it. And then Thor, no one gave a shit about. And I have I I had no faith in them being able to make that Loki movie. was the best parts, some of the best parts of both movies. So yeah. Yeah, uh what was interesting, did you ever hear that uh Whedon originally planned to have two villains in Avengers, but he saw the Hiddleston performance in Thor and said, No, he'll be fine, he'll be the lead. That's how good he was in that one yeah, the, role. That's the next thing I was gonna say yeah. is that's not just in part to what they've done because they are notoriously awful with their villains and setting up their villains. Tom Hiddleston's a big part of that. The guy's a fantastic actor. Which is, it's strange. For, for most of the villains, they've been able to get good, talented actors. It's just, for whatever reason, the villain development is like the last thing they focus on in the scripts. I feel like, even though they get great actors and everything, I don't feel like any of them besides Tom Hiddleston, have elevated the character. This is true. And it's, sometimes it's not... You know, I'm not saying anything bad about the performance. They were all good. Honestly, I don't know what they would have done different. A lot of the issues are scripting problems. But yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, the problem is with the script. And you can give them all a pass in the origin story film because there just yes. isn't enough time. Thor 2 has no excuse for an underdeveloped villain. And that's one of the Christopher most Christopher Eccleston, the ninth Doctor, is the fucking villain... Chris Reckleston, one of the better actors on the planet. He's fantastic in everything. I mean, dude, watch him. Watch Gone in sixty seconds if you want to know what kind of villain he is or what he can play. And he has no character. I can forgive Guardians. Guardians has a lot of main characters introduced to where I, you know, I I still love Guardians, but you can forgive it to the point to where the lack of villain development doesn't hurt the film. I think Thor two is hurt by Thor two's damage. Yes. But I feel like that's in large part due to the fact that they went back and wrote more Tom Hiddleston in. They wrote more Loki in. And I think that's where Christopher Eccleston got screwed, That's to that's, be that's honest with you. Because point. we don't know what the original film looked like or what scenes he had or what they had to cut out to make more room for Loki. But basically they had, I think... Like one or two scenes with Loki. Basically, they can't do Thor without Loki. So he had like, what, one or two scenes and test audiences just went cr- just batshit and when they, they saw did, him They did in use it. him beautifully in Thor 2. Yeah, and they were just like, oh God, what have we done? And they called the actors back in and wrote new scenes and rewrote old scenes and... Yeah, really quickly before we move on, I think the other two ones besides Thor 2 that come to mind that I thought were really hurt by villain development were Iron Man 2 and 3. And yeah, I, Iron I'll Man, agree with that. And Iron Man Two. I'm usually more forgiving of those movies than you are, but the villain development is pretty. The villain is development's pretty poor. bad. Yeah. All right, we've got. Uh, but you like, know, Marvel. So yeah, and that's the thing. They've never made a bad movie. It's it's when you talk about the MCU, it's all nitpicking. Yeah. It's all good. It's just good to varying degrees, you know. But uh, yeah, this I found this next article interesting. Uh, first of all, Joe Robert Cole is in talks to write Black Panther. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is he doesn't come from a background we're super familiar with. He was most famous for Amber Lake, which is something I am not familiar with, but that was what he was credited with on the, the Nerdist article. What I found interesting, though, was I didn't I would I didn't know the exact details of the way they went about their writing, but. What they do is they kind of call it the in-house writing system. Yeah. What they have them do, and it makes so much sense, and it shows uh, and gives more credence to just how good they are of planning everything. What they do is they have these writers submit scripts for multiple films. He is now doing the Black Panther one. He has already submitted a draft of Inhumans. Which, that's not supposed to be like, what, 2019? 
what, yeah, what, what they're doing is by having them do multiple drafts, they get a familiarity with the universe. Then when they hit one they really, really like, they push it to the front of the line. It's interesting. The first person that they had hit big with you their little... quality control to some degree that way, too. Uh, one of the writers of Guardians of the Galaxy, one of the final screenplay credits, who had a big hand in the script along with Gunn, yeah. she was part of the little in-house writing system. She submitted multiple scripts, and they eventually used part of her writing for Guardians, okay. which is very cool because... If they start writing multiple scripts with all these different characters, they get a feel for how they can combine them. So that's how it helps it feel interconnected. It's brilliant. Right. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. I love their idea of it. And uh, the DC guys need to be paying attention. Yes. Because they can barely get guys to write the one script for the movie they're hired to do. Yeah. These guys are planning years and years ahead in advance. And I just thought that was a really cool little tidbit. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move over uh, now that I brought over uh, brought up the DC stuff. Batman vs. Superman has just recently had some viral marketing focused heavily on Lex Luthor. I found this really, really interesting because the biggest complaint people have had about Jamie Eisenberg's Lex so far is that it doesn't feel like that suave politician where he's two-faced, where the, you know, the the public can like him enough to vote for him to be president, but behind the scenes, he's a motherfucker. Right. Well, the viral marketing shows that this Lex that we are seeing Eisenberg play is actually Lex Luthor Jr. And this is actually really, really close. I don't. You never really got into Smallville that much at all, right? No, Did you ever watch any at all? You never seen an episode. The way that they do Lex in that show is he's not Lex Luthor Jr., but his dad Lionel is basically the way Lex is. Lex in that show is the kind of young, smartass, you know, tech expert type guy yeah. who inherits the fortune. And here, he uh, is a billionaire at the age of 31. He is actually originally uh, from more of a uh, tech background. I'm trying to find in the article exactly the way that they uh, worded it. He inherits his father's aging petrochemical and heavy machinery company and turns it into a tech company. So this actually, uh, I thought, made, made it kind of cool because they had hinted at that you can't really say Eisenberg is bad for Lex if you don't know what Lex were going for. So they're right. going completely off the reservation and changing it, which could be good, could be bad, but I thought it was interesting. I'm just kind of adding it to the, the list of things that's going to cause this movie to fail. But. I think he ended up actually working for it because if, if he's a different type of Lex, you're not as... Like, if if they wanted Lex to be it's playing... pretty this, ballsy move, really. I, I mean, think, but, but that's can, about as ballsy as writing damage on the Joker's forehead. Thank God no one has done that yet. Thank God. Thank God. The uh, the thing, though, is if, if they had Eisenberg playing that suave President Lex doesn't really work as much as Mark Zuckerberg Lex. I can buy as Eisenberg in that what role better. What worries me by how crazy and odd he is in the trailer from what little bit you see is he's almost kind of Joker-esque and then eventually we're probably going to have him team up with the Joker. I just don't want two fucking Jokers. One uh, from yeah. Superman, one from Batman. Because that was the always the interesting dynamic between Lex and Joker. We've also only seen him as kind of like prototype Lex. You know, he's still yeah. got the hair. He hasn't kind of flipped to complete sinister crazy Lex, you know, yeah. trying to kill everybody. You know, who knows? This movie is so up in the air in every single facet. We literally have no idea until we finally get to They've see They've done a good job keeping a lid on a lot of things. Yeah? yeah. I mean, it's... Got every five seconds, the internet is reporting something as a rumor on it. So, yeah, yeah they, they've been able to keep a good lid on it. But, yeah. We've got one other little bit of the DC Cinematic Universe news to get to, and that is that the Flash solo film has found a director, finally. Originally tapped to do it were Phil Lord and Chris Miller, who, dude, if you just scroll through Nerdist, like, everything they've been attached to and either are doing or have left. It is ridiculous how all over Hollywood they are. Yeah. They were originally doing Flash. They left Flash to do... Uh, the Han Solo like um, spinoff film for Disney. They were in talks to do the animated Spider-Man movie that they're now doing in like a, a producer role. They're all over the freaking place. But yeah, yeah. The, the the director they replaced those two guys with is actually Seth Graham Smith, and it worries me because he wrote Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, <laughs> which I don't you know dislike. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Did you ever see Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter? I did not. It's incredibly goofy, which works for The Flash, 
but I would feel better about this if he was just the writer. This is his first time directing. I wouldn't have given a first time director the Flash. The Flash. Yeah, Espe- especially especially his popularity from the CW show. If if if, if this had been Aquaman at the moment. They could have probably gotten away with picking a, a, an unproven director. I would have right now gone for... Because it's a pretty big downgrade when you go from yes. those dudes to a first-time director. Yeah. He could knock out of the park. Again, we don't know. But these DC dudes... They must be pretty impressed with him to go from the two of them to him. To him. And, and something about him must have impressed them. Or He has an idea in his head already that he's pitched them and they loved it. He, there's something... There has to be something about him for them to make that step. Uh, he has, going for him, uh, the, Ezra Miller, the guy playing The Flash, is incredibly talented. Mm-hmm. You should really watch that Person Being a Wallflower movie. I think he's... In, just, I, I think he is on the verge of hitting He needs to stare at Emma Watson for a little bit longer. This is also correct. <laughs> All right, that actually wraps up the movie section, so we're moving right over to TV and continuing the Justice League trend. We reported recently, a few episodes ago, about that Justice League action cartoon, how they've been uh, basically rumored. Because wasn't it like a picture of a poster on the back wall? Yeah. It was like a big... Uh, there was a, a picture of several posters that are all upcoming shows. Some, uh, most all of them weren't announced, but there was this mysterious JLA poster with silhouettes of Superman and you know Batman and Hot Girl and all these other people on it. Yeah, they officially confirmed it. Uh, reported by Nerdist. Um, I, I forget who their source was or if they were even named, but they didn't release any details as far as who uh, would be in it as far as the Justice League members other than your obvious Trinity. I don't want them to Teen Titans go it. I really do not want them to Teen Titans go it. The the poster, they had their silhouettes. What you could see, they actually looked like... The old Justice like League Like the old Justice League characters. cartoon, which is, you know... Hopefully, when we find out more about who's behind it, if Bruce Bruce Tim was he supposed to be involved or anything? I think they're long gone from Cartoon Network. Then I, they're, I they're, don't know. They're fully in the realm of doing their animated movies now. I don't think they even want to go back. Because shit, dude, why would you? When you can go and do one of their movies whenever they want to, instead of having to jack well, with the way Cartoon Network's been yeah. hurting for something though, they could write a big enough check. This is true. I think Cartoon Network should. Cartoon Network is dumb enough where they wouldn't. Yeah. Even if you got just one of them, Deanie or Tim, either one. Alan Burnett, one Alan of them. Burnett, one of them. One of them, yeah. Then, but yeah, it would be fantastic. The only detail Cartoon Network confirmed was they're aiming to release it next fall. So it's going to be a while before we see it. Still a little bummed um, that the, uh, Beware of the Batman got canceled. It was a good show. Uh, it takes a little bit getting used to with the art style. Um that's also a big thing, too. We wouldn't even know if this is 3D animation yet. Yeah. I, I hope it's a cartoon, but knowing them, it's probably 3D. It's probably 3D. But, yeah, uh, another... Uh, I guess we have a couple of Marvel TV announcements to get through real quick. Uh, this is something um, I found interesting. Marvel and ABC are planning a sitcom in the MCU. And that sounds scary until you get into, I think, what is actually a cool idea. And that is, they are basing it on Dwayne McDuffie, who actually uh, helped create the Justice League cartoon with, with Bruce Timm and all okay. them. Do you remember the epilogue episode with the Batman Beyond tie-in? Yes. That was written by Dwayne McDuffie. Okay. He actually, I believe, was one of the creators for Static Shock. Okay. And uh, he unfortunately uh, just passed away a few years ago, but... Oh, wow. His uh, marquee well, left... Way to bring the room down. Well, he, he, his, he uh, left... A really, really, I think, significant mark on, especially with that Justice League cartoon. A lot of the best memories you have of that cartoon were from Dwayne McDuffie. Like, Mm -hmm. the epilogue episode might have been the best episode was a lot of Dwayne McDuffie. But uh, one of the comic books he actually created was a thing called Damage Control. Never heard of it. The way Damage Control worked was, uh, you know in the Avengers when the aliens fuck up all of New York City? Okay. Damage control are the dudes who come in and clean up after the I shit th- happens. I've heard, I've heard about this. I just didn't know what it was called. They are the dudes who come in and clean up after the alien invasions. That they would come be an in. awful job to yeah. have. They go in. They clean up after the Hulk has uh, broken Brooklyn, as they say in the movie. Or Harlem. It was Harlem. Yeah, it broke Harlem. Uh, so, 
Yeah, they're actually playing a sitcom, and I think that's really interesting. You know, they mentioned so is it just going to follow after each movie, basically? They could, uh, they could do oh, after... Oh, dude, so, uh, is it Sokovia or whatever? They have to clean up that they shit. They have to clean up that. They could, uh, they could tie it into the movies. They could tie it into the S.H.I.E.L.D. show. They could have crossovers. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I just thought it was a cool little idea, and, you know... Shit, they've been able to make everything else work. Why not make a sitcom? Yeah. You know? Why not even at least... I mean, they can at least try it. And it's, and, you know, it's so far out there that if it fails... Eh. I think it's worth trying. Yeah. And if nothing else, Dwayne McDuffie was a genius when it come, when it came to comic characters. Mm-hmm. So if if, uh, if if he was the original creator if on that it, has If that has a loyal fan base, it's all going to depend on how close to the comic they stick, probably. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, it's kind of cool, though. Pow- it's kind of a niche thing, it sounds like. But because of, just like with Jessica Jones, the power of the MCU, that got trending just because of its association yes. with, with Marvel. But, yeah, speaking of Jessica Jones, this was uh, have- This was kind of funny. We had in our notes to mention the Jessica Jones uh, bar trailer, trailer number three, and then... As we were texting back and forth about it, another trailer broke. So we're actually going to talk about two trailers on this. First up, uh, watch all of them. They're all fucking awesome. Oh, God, yes. I want the show right now. Uh, take all the, my money to give me the show now. The best one is the bar one. That was the second one. What was? The, I think they had a, a name for it. But if you just uh, YouTube Jessica Jones teaser trailers, you'll find it. It was officially labeled as teaser trailer three. Basically, it plays to uh, Joan Jett's bad reputation. Yeah. You see uh, her at the bar kind of getting a drink. Oh, she starts out with, she's actually at the jukebox starting up the song. And then she walks over to the bar to pour herself a drink over just like, what, like 12 dudes? Yeah, that, that something she, like that in slow motion, um, stepping over. All of these people that in the background, the bar is destroyed, and we've actually got it running without audio right now. I love the very beginning of it. She, the jukebox messes up. She taps it. Doesn't do anything. So she whacks it on the side, and the whole thing slides about six inches. Um, but yeah, she's the whole bar is destroyed. Everyone's kind of rolling around in agony, blood everywhere. But the best part of this trailer, in my opinion. Is at the very end. Oh, there's a guy in the background just like meh, smoking uh, everyday <laughs> occurrence. But the bloody knuckles picking up the shot glass. It's pretty bad. Taking the shot and then turning it upside down. Is uh, pretty this, badass. this show has been so cool about taking the opposite approach that Hollywood does. We don't. We haven't seen anything of the show, but they totally set the tone and mood of the show. Oh yes. The, the they they one, don't even really show her face yet or yeah, anything. They you know. Don't. If you've seen Breaking Bad, you know what she looks like, but still. Um, the evening stroll one was the one that broke recently, um, earlier this week, I believe. And, it was today. Uh, it was today. Mm-hmm. So, oh, this is as topical as we've ever been. Um, this one's a pretty ominous trailer, and this is the alleyway that you see in the original teaser that announced the um, launch date of November 20th. I love how it, everything has a purple hue to it. Yes. So we know she's got at least super strength because she crushes an alarm clock in the second trailer. And in this one, she leaps up to the fifth story of a building uh, after making sure no one's watching. So she can at least kind of like Hulk jump. Yeah. We don't know if she can fly or if she ever could fly, but she can at least kind of Hulk jump. But yeah, we you actually pointed out that it looks like they're releasing one every week. That's what it seems to I be. think eventually we're going to get at least one or two Purple Man ones of just... I think, ominous as shit tenant scenes. I think it's going to be the closer to November 20th that we get. It's going to be like the week before or something like that. They're going to, they know that he's, he's probably the biggest name in the show at the moment. He's by, he's by far the biggest draw so, of the show. Yeah, they're, they're going to save him. He might only get one and it might be like the second to last one or something. It was a move of brilliance attaching him to the show because this was the, uh, Iron Fist and Power Man aren't big names, but Jessica Jones is even smaller of a name. Yeah. So anyone who might have said, oh yeah, I'll just skip that one. I'm not really that into it. And then they cast David Tennant as the villain. I'll watch it. Yeah. I'm on board. Well, this works because speaking of David Tennant, we actually have some unfortunate Doctor <laughs> Who news to get to. This, when I read this, pissed me off. Legitimately pissed me off. So, Doctor Who, Ron... Yes. Literally infinite possibilities that you could do as far as spinoffs. Yes. In the 20 seconds it took me to write you a text message, I came up with three ten times better ideas for a spinoff than what we're actually getting. And if you haven't heard what we're getting, it will make you fucking facepalm. 
Uh, I mean, I'm not really spoiling anything by saying uh, the current companion, Claire Oswald, is a teacher. Very often they Spoilers. show her. Very often they show her at the school where she teaches at, and they show usually the usually, first scene you see her in. Usually, in particular, they show like two or three of her students. Yes, one of them is this little black girl with froofy hair. She's the one that always sticks out in my mind because she's in every flashback she has as a teacher and everything. Well, those little side characters who are her kids are getting their own show because you know when I watch Doctor Who, I want to watch a show about a fucking classroom of kids. I don't understand. I just, I don't. Okay, so a question I wanted to ask you, but I wanted to save it for the podcast because I knew we were going to, you know, actually sit and talk about this through the lightning round. Would you rather watch this show or a show that was starred solely Clara? Clara. Every wow. day of the week. Because. You were pissed. <laughs> because she's a fucking companion of the doctors. What the fuck are they doing with the kids? Yeah, I don't know. Um,. One of the things that you suggested I really liked was um, Martha and Spoilers. Mickey. Now we're going to be getting into Doctor Who spoilers oh, yeah. if you're not. Yeah. So, Doctor Who spoilers. Um, Martha and Mickey. Okay. Out of nowhere, they're like married the last time you see them. And they're fighting a war against Centaurans. Why and how? Like, that would be really cool to go into, I think. And it's actually fan service. And yes. fan service draws attention. You know what doesn't draw attention? The fucking kids in Claire Oswald's classroom. Could you imagine, like, halfway through, it's like season two or three, again, spoilers, would be that scene that they just cut out and put in where David Tennant saves them? Yeah. Right before he's about to yeah. regenerate. But, I mean... Okay. I would do that I just to do it. D- typically, I don't have an issue with them making a spinoff specifically for like young adults. That's what this is based around. This is That's why this is I'm happening. I'm not even sure this is aiming at young adults. It might even be lower than that. A lot of kids watch Doctor Who. Yeah. It's just... And what, you know kids love to watch kids. What's, what's frustrating, though, is that this is coming from Doctor Who, which yes. has literally infinite possibilities it has the most brilliant plot. you know even if you're testing the waters that is a weak test that's not even sticking your toe in. this was the other thing i pointed out to you this isn't even like a web series they're testing this is currently slated for eight 45 minute full length episodes they're what, agent cartering it what the serious fuck bbc <laughs> um an idea that i had that i didn't write you is i wanted to save it for us to see what you would think is it's kind of a reboot of Torchwood, but use unit. A million times better idea. You've got um, Alistair's daughter that is a recurring character already. Show everything that she does. million times better idea. It, if you take five seconds to come up with an idea about Doctor Who, it will be better yeah. than this... What was it? Class. I think that was the name of it, right? Yeah, it's class. Just, it, it's not even the most creative name. Fuck, man. Like, <laughs> I was so pissed about this. Because, you know, it's it's literally... It's just the principle of the thing. Yeah. Anyone... If anyone who has seen three episodes of the show in five seconds can come up with a better spinoff. Yeah. You know what would be another one? Uh, go more into Davros's background. Yeah. Pay, pay, I don't know ma- how much of that you could do without having the doctor in it. Then it's not a spinoff. What about um, go more into how many we we don't even know all of the masters regenerations. Do more about the master. In- yeah, the master spinoff series would be great. And then you know, spoilers. He slash she can still be popping in and out of Doctor Who. But and you know another thing I was about to point out was we have an entire alternate universe that has Rose and her family in it. I mean. Uh, the uh, I will go ahead and go, uh, mention the other ones we we were throwing back and forth. Uh, big spoilers for Doctor Who if you're not caught up. Amy and Rory in the twenties. You yeah. can do anything with them. That would be a huge fan that, service. That would be fucking fantastic. Um, and what was the other one? Oh, um, any, bring the Weeping Angels back too. Yeah. Any uh, the the other idea I had just in that quick text I sent you, um, Martha. Uh, not Martha, uh, Donna, who lost all of her memories of her mm-hmm. adventures with the Doctor. Even a little web series where she's remembering through dreams some of her adventures she thought she had fully, that, that everyone thought she had fully lost. Would have yeah. been a little intriguing little, you know, side note. And you know what? She could get into real danger, too, because remember, she has a defense mechanism built in. Because when the, the Masters, because there was, the entire planet was Master except for her, um, when they went to attack her, she let out like this, like energy blast of like regeneration energy 
that just took them all out. Yeah, they they could have done like Doctor Who Inception. Yeah, because she's Doctor Donna. That's the problem with her. Yeah, she's yeah, Doctor Donna. Yeah. she's half human, half Time Lord now. And anything they can do with her would have been more interesting than what I mean, they're doing. Fuck, they can make her her own Jessica Jones. She was already doing investigative shit like that, like Sarah Jane was. So yeah. No, they could do any anything. I have even watched Torchwood. I would have preferred a spinoff of any of the Torchwood characters. Yeah, that I have even seen would have been better than this shit. But yeah, we've spent way too much time on this. Yeah, we, we have. have one more uh, Doctor Who story to get to. John Hurt, famously known as the War Doctor in the uh, Tenet. The Doctor Eight Point Five. <laughs> yeah, Eight Point Five. Uh, what was the name of the Tenet Matt Smith movie? Uh, Day of the Doctor. Okay, he he played in that one. Like Ron said, Doctor Eight Point Five, basically the yeah, War Doctor. Yeah, there's a there's a seven minute short, curiously, that we did not know about that Stephen Moffat wrote and directed. It stars uh, what's the name of the guy that was the Eighth Doctor in the American Made TV movie? Oh, um, blanking on his name, but yeah, he it was in the he, he that's the only time he ever played that's, the character. Well, was yeah. it was um, he played the role for the American Made Fox, I believe, TV movie in like the mid-90s. It failed horribly here, and in true Fox fashion, they didn't pursue it. It did well worldwide, but since it failed for American audiences, they canceled it. And then Stephen Moffat had done Day of the Doctor, which was, I believe, like the 50th anniversary special or something yeah, like that, that was right. the point. So... That's why it starred three doctors and did everything that it did. And, you know, it goes into the time war. Watch it if you haven't seen it. It's great. But before you do, there's a seven minute short that should be still available on YouTube. Articles were linking it. Um, but it, uh, is the eighth doctor, the only American doctor and his story of how he becomes Dr. 8.5, which is John Hurt. That's a seven minute short. It ends with introducing John Hurt. Which is funny because he'd already been introduced in Name of the Doctor. Yeah, um, and, and very briefly. Because at the know. very end, spoilers, when it shows him, he turns around. It literally just goes, introducing John, John Hurt as, as the, the do- War Doctor. Yeah. And then in the next episode is Day of the Doctor. So, yeah, no, it was pretty interesting. But, yeah, so John Hurt is an amazing actor. In everything he's ever done. And... You know, what you had told me was originally the War Doctor was supposed to be Christopher Eccleston. That was the original plan, but Christopher Eccleston was either doing Thor 2 or had some other contractual obligation where he couldn't do it. Yeah, so they, instead they used uh, archive footage of him in a scene, and they got John Hurt, which amazing, amazing actor. Um, 1984 is one of my favorite movies. He's the main star in it, and, which is funny because 1984, he's being oppressed by a government and then in V for Vendetta, he's the guy doing the oppressing. Um, I, was, I think of Alien. Yeah. When I think of John um, He's in um, Harry Potter. So he's a big icon over there. So to get him and the War Doctor, you know, would be just mind-blowing if you're from if you're British. Yeah. That big of an actor. Um, but, yeah, so he's returning for an audiobook series, four-part. Supposed to premiere in December. Um, that may be enough to get me into audiobooks, Jeff. I don't know. I fucking loved John Hurt as the War Doctor. Have you ever listened to an audiobook? I have not. I think I've I listened. have come close with Hollywood Babylon, but... Well, the, the biggest issue is they're just fucking expensive a lot of the time. Like, yeah. Uh, the, I've, I think I've listened to one. I believe I listened to one of the Harry Potters, which probably took me like three years. Just, <laughs> it was one of the later Harry Potter books. Right. I don't, I don't know. It's interesting. It all depends on the actors, and the biggest draw to this is it's actually John Hurt. That's, yes. That's the draw. And we know reported on the uh, the Torchwood one with uh, Jack John Harkness Bar- coming John Barrowman. Yeah, yeah I'm coming back for Jack And Hartness. I think other Torchwood guys, too, were coming back for it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so they're, yeah, they're all coming back for it. It's very cool. I, man, how cool is it to see... Does that mean radio shows are coming back? I mean, that's essentially what that is, is well, downloadable uh, radio show. Part of it, why that current and probably big reason for this is... What renewed that interest, I think, was Serial. Serial hit very, yeah. very big, and people are getting back into that. And, I mean, what are we doing right now? We're doing a podcast, you know? Yeah. It's not a radio show of, like, a fictional story, but people are getting back into it because, you know, a lot of people have commutes. A lot of people have long plane rides that, they, you know, podcasts are becoming huge. Yeah. Slowly but surely. So, I mean, just audio formats in general. And, you know, more John Hurt, amazing. <laughs> more great. John Hurt can't hurt. God damn it, Ron. You just, <laughs> you can't go a full episode. Nope. All right. Well, another show we love is Game of Thrones. Oh, God, yes. Well, the Roman check out Game our, of Thrones. Uh, check out our hard home commentary if you haven't yet. 
Uh, the Rome and Game of Thrones producers are planning a new fantasy show in 2017. It'll be a 12-part series called The Perished Land. Which, how the hell, with the success of Game of Thrones, do we not have like 15 Game of Thrones ripoffs on TV? I think a lot of it is, why would you even try to compete with that? Well, e- even if, I, I get that, but you'd still think they'd try. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's interesting. Um, fantasy typically doesn't seem to do as well as, like, say, sci-fi or drama, um, or sci-fi drama. Uh, but I don't know. Fantasy usually tends to be like hit and miss with some people. I, I mean, you think with I mean, Lord of the Rings and Hobbit both did really well. Game of Thrones. Yeah. I, I I don't think I get what you're saying about I think, why you though, that those are because I mean those were written. Back in the Depression era, I mean, those are old. I, I mean, they've been around for a while. I, I get what you're saying about why you why you would try to compete, but people are trying that with Walking Dead right now. We reported a few times on how there's a shit ton of zombie shows on the horizon. Yeah. So I'm surprised we don't have a Witcher show out, or we don't have other. That's the one that blows my fucking mind. It's the just popularity, there. the books, the games. It's just sitting there for the taking. Yeah, and I mean. Maybe not everyone has to try and copy it, but Showtime and Cinemax should be trying to compete, I think, with something like The Witcher or... Because, I mean, why? Why wouldn't you at least why try? You? I don't get it. It's, it's weird, but uh, this was uh, coming out in 2017. Any word on what this is about? Um, I read the article. Uh, they were being kind of vague. Let's see. The, the, it's an original story and will mirror the history of uh, Talenton. Which was all stuff that it was kind of outside my wheelhouse. I'm not even sure what exactly they're talking about. Uh, the, the, they did have a funny thing on Nerdist saying that since this is not written by George R. R. Martin, some of the characters you love might stay alive. <laughs> so that was that was funny. Uh, yeah, we're gonna move over to the uh, last portion of the news this week, and that is in gaming, and that is the Kanazis are back, Ron. Uh, they're shenanigans. I swear to God, these bastards. So what have they done now, Jeff? So what have they not done at this point, Ron? Uh, it's a short list. The Kanazis, as we like to call them, fittingly. So I don't know if you're how familiar are you with the way that the, the uh, mother base system works in Metal Gear Solid Five? Not at all. The only reason I haven't played a Metal Gear Solid game since the original PlayStation. The only reason I'm familiar with it is because of another uh, video gaming site I follow. Are they really into it over there? But the way it works is you have... just saying that, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. The mother base is like your little hub, and what you can do is you can customize it, pimp it out however the way you want it. But you are constantly hooked in online play where other players can actually go and damage your hub. So a big part of the online multiplayer component is actually... I already see where this is going. The Kanazis (laughs) are selling... If I'm right. They are selling... Insurance that Fucking you pay a. with real life money to insure what you have set up in your hub world. Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> oh, no. So the only reason that is a gameplay component is because they were going to be selling insurance w- for real money later. Yeah, it is a. Comp- it was not a creative decision by Kojima. It was a Konami decision to make money. Hopefully it's easier than actual insurance. You know, you don't have to fight with the adjuster. And uh, Do they have to have, like, an admin walk a character out and do a damage assessment and tell you what you're approved for? This is so freaking ridiculous. Dude, all I'm, I'm just glad that, at least for the time being, Konami is leaving video games and just worrying about their pachinko machines and their, love, their health spas. I love the article on this. It literally says, fucking insurance. It's <laughs> what the article literally says. Yeah, and it was a uh, it was a 960 megabyte update that Konami applied this morning, where players can now purchase with real money. How how can the Kanazis find a way every week to come across as a different type of scumbag? I, That's my question. I don't know. It's like they're the, trying. They're they're shooting real hard to be a dick every way they can. I think it's just freaking. I I am so glad. So glad Kojima was able to get away from them. Even though it cost us Silent Hills, and even though it looks like we're not going to get any Metal Gear games for a while, 
at least some of those poor people working with them or for them can get away from those horrible working conditions. Yes. They all sound like assholes. Go off, do your health spa shit, and then just fade away. I don't ever want to fucking have to report on them again. They are horrible They'll fucking They'll be fading people. eventually since they're going to be focusing on mobile gaming mostly. They're fucking so. horrible people, but yeah. Uh, we had another big video game announcement, and that is that today, Far Cry Primal got announced. I think it was either today or yesterday. I could be wrong. Uh, I think it was... When did you do the notes? Today? Today. So it was today. Yeah, I guess it was. It was a long ass day. Far Cry Primal is being released next February. The whole draw of it is, I think they might be basing it around the engine of the most recent one, which was Far Cry 4. They did this similarly with Blood Dragon. Blood Dragon was the Far Cry 3 map, but they made it like a parody of 80s action movies, which is really fun if you ever played Blood Dragon. It's awesome. It's it's hilarious. I've never played Far Cry. Uh, I have only played the Blood Dragon one, but you would love Blood Dragon. They open it up. With the opening scene of Predator where they're playing Long Tall Sally in a helicopter <laughs> with the turret. It's amazing. But yeah, uh, me and a few friends of mine are kind of freaking out over this. And then Ron is taking the negative Nancy approach of not getting it at all. I don't understand. And this is uh, all I wanted to say about it. Is how many thousands of games are available to you, Ron, to where you can shoot uh, Nazis? Several. How many games are there where you can play modern military? All of them. Just All about. of them. If it's first person shooter, it's how many of them can you attach a rock to a stick and then beat your <laughs> friends to death with said stick? This one, I'm all on board, man. I, I just I can ride a mammoth and trample my buddies with it. That's pretty fucking cool, in my opinion. I don't know. I just I'm watching this trailer and I just don't see the appeal. Uh, okay, it's another thing we talked about the other day off off mic. If there was a Call of Duty or uh, Battlefield, any of those of the Civil War, where you had one shot with a musket, <laughs> does that appeal to you? Because that stuff like that appeals to me because it's different. Yeah. I am sick and de- I'm sick to death of the modern military games where I appreciate them being different. That one would definitely depend on how it's done because I feel like that could go really well or really bad. I think it'd be hilarious because if you and me are in like. Uh, multiplayer in like a search and destroy type thing where it's one live and we're running around in circles loading our muskets I think it'd be <laughs> hilarious and fun but yeah uh, we got totally off topic but Far Cry Primal I'm excited for it Ron will never play it in his life so yeah, that's, no. I guess that's all we have to say uh, okay Target actually leaked a major major Sony announcement and that is that the PS4 will be cut down to $350 just because of the holiday season this is a uh, release being changed now, I think. They've probably been wanting to do this for a while. I'm sure. To compete with the Xbox One price, but I think they were waiting for the holiday season. Yeah. Uh, they also announced this is going to be a permanent change. This is not a, a limited sale for the holidays. Because I think originally, actually, the Xbox One price change mm-hmm. was going to be limited to the holidays, and then they made it permanent so, because they sold so many. Does that mean that at this point... That they probably made their money back on all the patents and all of the other things that they couldn't get a return on. They they finally, you know, what I'm talking about like when you have to sign like a two year contract with like AT and T or whoever. It's because it takes them that long to make their money back on you. Yeah. Do you think that they finally made their money back and now they can just drop the price? Yeah, and and it makes sense. I mean, it's, this is what because two- the, the Xbox One had to do it solely to compete because they were getting their asses handed to them. Yeah. The uh- I don't think they made their money back before they did it. I, I I think you're right. Uh, yeah, the uh, the 350 makes it completely. I mean, and what's crazy is they were more expensive and they were still beating Xbox One. Yeah, Xbox One made it a, a competition with their price drop. Xbox, hardcore Xbox 360 people bought PS4s, dude. Yeah, uh, I know a few of my friends who did the exact same thing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, if you have not bought a PS4 yet, now is a good time. Now is a good well, time. Well, not now, but later is a good time. Once they release it to 350. For the, once they release it for 350 I think it's a great buy because half the fucking games that were originally going to come out this year got pushed <laughs> makes back. makes it cheaper than PlayStation VR. <laughs> Good job, Sony. <laughs> it's going to be cheaper than its peripheral. That's why it's going to fail, Ron. It was the same price, but now it's cheaper. God damn it. Why did they do that? <laughs> 
All right, we've got one more uh, article to this get to. This one blew my ever loving mind. I had to read it like two, three times to even understand it correctly, what you said. This one, uh, I wanted to end on just because I, th- I found a, a funny article. So, a fan who has entirely too much free time, and I am jealous of them. Uh, right? In Imagine my, what you and I could get done with that amount of free we would, time. We would just rewatch Doctor Who. We wouldn't actually get anything done. Yeah, probably. We'd play uh, Transformers Devastation for 10 straight hours. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> Hashtag no regrets. So, said fan built a fully functional, or is in the process, he might be done now, has been building a fully functional Pokemon Red in Minecraft. What in the actual fuck? All I'm saying is I've never have had any interest in Minecraft at all. I would play this just out of curiosity yes. to see how it works. So he's having to do 151, presumably, Pokemon. In Minecraft. I don't not know. to mention all the NPCs, all the buildings, every city and town, all the game mechanics, the stats. Did you see they had... All the moves, the animations for every move. Did you see they actually had a layout of his map? Uh-uh. And they did, like, it had all of the cities. It's insane, dude. Like, well, once this comes there, out... Let's see, there's... They were all eight. colors, right? There's, there's like eight or nine different colored names. Yeah, I was thinking there must be like ten to twelve. Because there's at least eight for the badges and there's a couple that don't have yeah. gems. Dude, it's insane. It's going to be a huge map. I might actually give Minecraft like five dollars just to check this out. Yeah, that's... out of Just like, that dude, if I had that amount of free time, like you said, we would dick around a lot, but I wish I had that amount of free time. Yeah, I really do. Because seriously. That must be nice. That must be nice. Fucker got laid off. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only, th- only thing I can think of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who sits at their house? He's like, you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> you don't know what they don't have in Minecraft? They don't have Pokemon Red in Minecraft. I'm going to do that. This that, that had to start at a bar, right? I don't think this guy leaves his house, dude. <laughs> But I think on that note, we're going to go ahead and sign off for the day. All if you would right. like to follow us more, you can check out all of our stuff over on YouTube. We put all the podcasts. We have started recently doing regular Let's Plays, finally. We've got Five Nights at Freddy's 3, Five Nights 4, started a Dark Souls sequential, and just got done recording Transformers Devastation. We were actually topical, Ron. High yes. five. I can't we were topical it. after seven months of recording. <laughs> it's fucking fantastic. Yeah, you can uh, uh, subscribe to on YouTube and get all of our content over there. Uh, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher. That's where we put up the audio uh, stuff we do. You can follow some of our posts we do to Facebook, facebook.com forward slash TWBE podcast. We're over on Twitter, where I forget about it, but Ron does updates. That's it. <laughs> See, I forget Facebook. That's funny. Well, I guess we should. We're a pair. Yeah. Wonder Twin Powers activate. <laughs> uh, at Twitter, we are at TWBE Podcast. And uh, if you'd like to, you can actually go over to iTunes and uh, leave us a little uh, five-star review. Because you, know, you love us. Yes. Because you love us for sure. We will accept four you stars. You have to be if you're still listening. For, yeah. Thank you, Dylan. <laughs> we, we Fuck will, Reese. Hello, Dylan. <laughs> I think Reese actually gave us gave up on us, too, yeah. at some point. Hey, he put in, he put in the, uh, you know, he put up the long fight, but... Eventually. He, he started with us at the bad times, too. Yeah, we might need to... I need to send him the Let's Plays. I think the Let's Plays have been a lot of fun. All right, guys. Uh, was there anything I missed? I don't think... I think I hit everything. I think that's it, yeah. All right, I am Jeff. I'm Ron. We are the Will Be Extra Tips, and we will catch you next time. <laughs> <laughs>